Let's give it up for all the things that are happening at City First. We're so grateful that each and every one of you are here and you in the room could join me in welcoming all of our locations, Cape Coral, Janesville, God Behind Bars. Let's give it up. So glad that you are here and if you're joining us online, we are so glad that you are joining us as well. Well, as you know, we are in this At The Movie series and where we're taking modern day stories and connecting them to spiritual truths. In the movie, we say this every week, it's just the beginning of the conversation. It's not the main point, but one of the main ways that Jesus actually communicated the kingdom message was to tell stories that had themes and elements that people could relate and connect with. And it's the way he brought the message of heaven near and made it understandable. And our movie today is an inspirational story about the 1936 JV rowing boat from Washington University. And this movie, like you just heard, it's an underdog story about a group of young boys, uh, young men, who in the middle of the Great Depression find themselves trying out for a rowing team. And here's the deal, it's not because they want to, it's because they have to. See, there's not enough money, even for some of them, for food, let alone tuition for the university, And when an opportunity comes up for work, out of absolute desperation, they try something a little unconventional. Let's watch. Our scene opens at the University of Washington during the Great Depression. Our protagonist, Joe, is desperate to make money and finds out that they will pay those who make the JV rowing team. So he decides to try out for the team. Though he has zero experience in the sport, the odds do not look great as they are only looking to pick eight guys from the many that showed up for their JV team. The coaches welcome them with a challenging speech saying that many will quit before the end because it's too hard and not worth it. The eight-man crew is the most difficult team sport in the world. The coach goes on to say that the average will not get a seat on my boat. The men begin to train, moving on through rounds of rigorous physical testing. They take to the waters in rotating teams of eight to begin to understand what it looks like to row as a team. Our main character, Joe, is strong, not giving up, and realizes that there is more to this team than just making the money. They reach the end of testing, and Joe, along with seven other strong men, make the JV team. Well, I know some of you are a little disappointed because you thought we were going to be doing the movie Jurassic Park today based on my outfit. So, uh, but we went a different route. Okay, so (laughs) we're talking about the boys in the boat. And if those of you who know me, you know that I love a good underdog story. Anybody else in here just love a good underdog story? Like, yes, yes. Now listen, this movie took place in 1936, nearly 90 years ago. Okay, that's a long time. Now, what you may not understand about rowing is that it was the most popular sport of the day. It was like the NFL or the NBA of of, of its time. So it's hard for us to imagine that, right? But that's the way it was. And it was a really big deal for these young men to make this team. See, they didn't have experience or pedigrees, but they had heart and they were a little desperate, some of them a lot desperate. They didn't have money or clout, but they had drive and determination. And they weren't special by any stretch of the imaginations. People wouldn't have deemed them as special, but guess what? They were just the common man. And here's the deal, 2,000 years ago, guess what? Jesus actually chose his own crew. It wasn't an eight-man crew, but it was a 12-man crew. And guess what? They were also underdogs. They had not been chosen by the religious leaders and elite of the day to be on the A-team, per se, okay? They had, and, and so once they weren't picked to be like a rabbi and picked to be in rabbi school, guess what? They just went back to their normal professions. And then Jesus showed up. And you know what? Jesus himself loves a good underdog story. He loves a good underdog story. 
And if you're wondering what we are here all about at City First Church, guess what? We're just a bunch of underdogs. <laughs> bunch of underdogs who met Jesus. And Jesus changed everything. We're a ragtag bunch of people, aren't we, City First Church? Aren't we? Just a ragtag bunch. We were broken, but he put us back together. It's our story. We were sinners, yet he extended grace and forgiveness to each one of us. We had done our own thing, but guess what? He did a new thing inside of us. How many of you are grateful for Jesus that he loves a good underdog story? See, the boys in the boat, the movie follows a young man by the name of Joe Rance and his relationship with the team and also the boat. And today, I want to look at scripture, at a young man whom Jesus chose and it just so happened to involve a boat. <laughs> we're gonna read the story in Luke chapter five and we're gonna walk through it together and learn about, I would say this, the character of Jesus and who he is and how good he is. So let's look at Luke chapter five, verses one and two. It says, on one occasion, Jesus was preaching to a crowd on the shore of Lake Galilee. A vast multitude of people was pushing to get close to hear the word of God. He noticed two fishing boats at the water's edge with the fishermen nearby rinsing their nets. We're gonna read in just a moment that one of these boats belonged to a, a boy, Simon Peter. Now next to Jesus, this is the main character of our reading today. And it's important to note that before this encounter that we're reading, Simon Peter and Jesus had already met once before, okay? This is not the first time they are meeting. Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, actually met Jesus first and then brought him to Jesus, and I wanna read uh, how that event went down. So this is a little flashback, okay? In John chapter one, 41 and 42, we see uh, when Peter first meets Jesus, and it's kind of an awkward story, okay? It says, the first thing that Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked right at Peter and said, two sentences, you are Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. So Peter, Andrew brings Simon Peter to meet Jesus and this is how it goes down, okay? I'm sure there was much more anticipation for Peter. He's like, We're gonna, I'm gonna meet the Messiah. And he introduces to him and he looks at him and goes, you're Simon and you will be called Cephas. And then we don't know any more about it. That's all we know. It's such an awkward encounter. Because first of all, Peter's probably thinking, okay, Jesus knows my name, first of all, right? And second of all, is he changing my name? <laughs> like, what is this? I always thought this was a strange interaction, but I want you to see something, is that Peter would have been a good Jewish boy, and he had knowledge of a God who changes names. He knew the stories found in the Old Testament where God told Abram that you will now be called Abraham and your wife Sarai will be called Sarah. And then there's that time when Jacob's name was changed to Israel. See, Peter was very familiar with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Very familiar with the God who changes names, changes stories. So this is what I gather from that. I can guarantee that this little two-sentence encounter, guess what? It rocked Peter's world. He was like, what just happened? It shook him up. It disturbed him a little. And this is what I know. He knew it was significant. It was significant what just happened. So fast forward to our current story. When Jesus makes his way to the shore, first of all, Jesus knew exactly where he was going, okay? This wasn't happenstance. He knew exactly where he was going. He makes his way to the shore where he knows Peter will be. And I love this. Jesus doesn't leave Peter hanging. He shows up and meets him right where he's at. 
Continuing the story in verse three, it says this, Jesus climbed into the boat belonging to Simon Peter and asked him, let me use your boat. Push it off a short distance away from the shore so I can speak to the crowds. There's a lot packed in this little verse. I love that it says this, that Jesus asked him. Jesus asked Peter. Oftentimes we think that Jesus just shows up on the scene demanding, but no, he asks. You know what that's called? Free will. He asks. Jesus is never gonna make you do anything. You know it? He's not going to. He simply presents the options and then he waits for us to make our move or not. But here's the beauty of it. At the end of the day, he knows what's best and what waits on the other side of our obedience, on the other side of our yes. What did Jesus request of Peter? This, simply, let me use your boat. Let me use your boat. And today, no matter where we're watching from, I think Jesus asked the same of us. Let me use what you already got. See, Jesus didn't ask Peter for a spaceship because Peter wouldn't have known what that was. It seems absurd, right? Well, of course he didn't ask Peter for a spaceship. He asked him to use his boat. Guess what? That's what he had. Jesus will ask to use these things. First, your position, what you do, your possessions, what you have, and your passion, what you love. That's what Jesus wants. That's, well, it's what he wants, but it's what he's going to ask you to use. It's what he's going to ask you, your position, your possessions, and your passion. And we all have all three of those things. Peter was a fisherman. He had a boat, and he loved fishing. And Jesus was like, let me use that. But sometimes we overcomplicate it, don't we? <laughs> See, Jesus didn't ask Peter for something he didn't have. And listen, he didn't ask him to go far. He said this, let me use your boat. And what did he ask Peter? He said, just push it off a short distance from the shore. Just, just do something. Let's just move back a little bit. Let's just do a little bit. Why did he ask him to do that? Verse three said this, so I can speak to the crowds, Jesus said. See, a lot packed in this little verse. Jesus is like, if you let me use what you have, Peter, guess what? I can speak to the crowds. God wants to use what you have, your possessions, your passions, your position to speak to others. Do you know that? He's not asking you for something you don't already have, something actually he hasn't already given you. See, Jesus stood in Peter's boat and spoke a message to the crowds, and he wants to do the same thing with what you have. He's got a message that he wants to speak through your story. Peter had a boat. What do you have? I really want you to think about it. What do you have? What do you have? Because this is what I know. If we give him our position and our possessions and our passion, he will use it to speak to others. He'll use it. What happens next in the story, verses four and five, it says this. It says, when he had finished, meaning when Jesus had finished speaking to the crowds, he said to Peter, now that I've met you on the shore and you've rowed a short distance, now row out to deep water to cast your nets and you will have a great catch. Master, Peter replied, we've just come back from fishing all night and didn't catch a thing. But if you insist, I want everybody to say those three words with me. If you insist, we will go out again and let down our nets because of your word. See, once you've allowed Jesus to use your, bo your boat and then row a short distance from the safety of the shore, there will come a time when he asks you to row out to deep water. And what is the deep water for us today? It's the place where things don't make sense, right? If you follow Jesus for any amount of time, he's going to ask you at some point to do something that doesn't make sense. Because you know why? The word of God is filled with all kinds of things that to the world, it doesn't make sense. 
It just doesn't make sense. And the deep waters is also, it's the place that requires a greater level of trust. Yes, there was a level of trust on the shore. Yes, there was a level of trust in in the, the short distance from the shore. But guess what? The deep waters, there's a greater level of trust. See, here's the deal. Peter was tired. They had already fished all night and caught nothing. And you don't catch fish in the daytime. So Jesus was asking for crazy things. What he asked for didn't make sense. And then what does Peter say? But if you insist, if you insist, because of your word, it doesn't make sense, but I trust you. And this is what I've realized on this journey with Jesus over the last almost 35 years I've followed him, is that the longer I walk this faith journey, the more I realize it's a faith journey. (laughs) We sometimes, we balk at the idea when we feel like God's kind of asking us to do something, and we're like, well, why would he ask? Because it's all about faith, which means this, we don't understand it, and it doesn't always make sense. It's a trust journey. You know, life has thrown me things that I didn't understand, and he's done the same, it's done the same to you, right? God hasn't asked me to, and God has asked me to do things that just doesn't make sense sometimes. He's put me in places where I knew that if I didn't do something, nothing was going to happen. And so what I did is I picked up my oars and I got in the boat and I started rowing. And sometimes, I'll be real honest with you, sometimes I did it a little begrudgingly. You're like, well, okay. Really, this is what you're asking me to do? But at the end of the day, guess what? Let's say it, those three words together. If you insist. If you insist. See, in our Western mindset, we tend to think that Jesus is all about our comfort and ease. Why would he send us out to deep waters? But really, can I tell you this? That couldn't be further from the truth. Jesus, newsflash, is not real concerned about your comfort. I know you're like, what? I don't like that message. He's not real concerned about our comfort, yet he provides comfort, right? But those things, comfort is not given to us so that we can live a life of ease. You know what it's meant for? They're meant, it's meant to be our companion as we are busy fulfilling our purpose, taking risks and giving our lives (laughs) so that Jesus can be made famous. Gives us comfort. See, what does deep water look like for you today? It might look like, you want me to do what, Jesus? You want me to forgive that person? You want me to look into foster care? You want me to let go of that grudge? You want me to step into that role? You want me to love that person who believes completely different than I do? You want me to become a generosity rock star? You want me to get baptized next week? Deep water. You want me to stop doing that? You want me to break up with them? You want me to begin leading what? You want me to go where? You want me to start praying for who? And then guess what? We hear this story and guess what we read? If you insist. But this is what I know about the character of God is that he doesn't ask us to trust him because he likes to see us live afraid. It's because, listen, it is in the space of trust where the amazing things happen. It's in that space of trust where the incredible things happen. So back to our movie, okay? Joe and the team overcome a lot of adversity and find themselves in a race that determines which team goes to the 1936 Olympics. So let's watch what happens. The team has trained long and hard and have made it to their qualifying competition for a spot in the Olympics. With many people doubting what they are able to do, the coaches are confident that they will succeed. Called the underdog boat, their coaches picked them over the varsity team to compete. So much is riding on this race. They line up to race and there's a hush over the crowd and the water as they wait for the go. Their jockey is sitting ready. The shot sounds and they're off, racing against advanced senior teams from around the country as the only junior boat in the competition. 
falling back to last place, four links behind the leader, they are conserving their energy. The jockey begins to bring the team speed up and they start to gain on the competitors. Picking up the pace, the team begins to row in sync and in strength. They are flying by the other teams. As they reach second place, their jockey yells, this one's for all the people that didn't believe in you. They begin their final ascent toward the finish line, landing them in first place to win the race. They are on their way to the Olympic Games. All right, give it up for the Washington Huskies. <laughs> As we close, I want you to notice a few things. There were eight men rowing, but there were nine men in the boat. There's a spot in the boat called the helmsman, and he's the ninth person. He's a very important person. See, the helmsman is the one who can see where the boat is going. He's the one who is steering. He's the one who knows his team and what they are capable of. He's the one who sets the pace, right? Wait, wait, go, go. He's the one with the full perspective. And I don't know if you could see it there, but the crew cannot see where they're heading. They can't see where they're going because essentially they're rowing backwards. So they have to trust the helmsman. Trust the one who's steering. In fact, in rowing, here's something. I have really enjoyed actually studying rowing this week. See, the crew should never be looking to the right or to their left to see where they are at in the race because it can throw off the balance of the boat. The boat is 60 feet long. It's a long boat. <laughs> and narrow, it can lose balance really quickly. And if one of the crew members looks to the right or to the left, it can cause drag and slow down the boat. There has to be intense focus. Guess what? The scriptures are full of verses that talk about, don't look to the right, don't look to the left, look to the helmsman, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Guess what? He knows what you got inside of you. And the most important thing is this, he is in the boat with you. He's in the boat with you. Our job is to keep rowing and trust the one who's at the helm. It's what our whole faith is about. We have trust in the one who knows us, who loves us, the one who met us on the shore, the one who was with us in the boat. He's the one we trust. Because what happens when we trust? When we say, if you insist, God, let's look at verse six and seven, because we're not done with our scripture story yet, right? It says, when they pulled up their nets after they had rowed out to the deep and done what Jesus asked, it said they were shocked to see a huge catch of fish, so much that their nets were ready to burst. They waved to their business partners in the other boat for help. They ended up completely filling both boats with fish until their boats began to sink. <laughs> Only the deep church produces the miraculous catch. We don't get the miraculous catch in the shallows, a short distance from the shore. We get the miraculous catch out in the deep waters. See, we all love to see the product, right, of someone else's faith and trust, and sometimes we can think it comes easy for people, it doesn't. You know, for the people sitting on the cheering crowds, sometimes they're watching the boats, they're like, okay, I think I could do that. It looks, you know, it doesn't look as hard when it's from a distance, but if you're in the boat, it's a whole heck of a lot of hard work, right? And some of you, you are in the boat right now, and you're like, Jen, I wanna give up rowing. <laughs> I want to give up Rowan, but may we have the attitude of if you insist. And then we grab our oars and we keep rowing out to deep waters. I actually got a text from a friend um, in between the first and second services, and she said, I needed the, today's message. She goes, and this is what she said, I'm going to keep on rowing. I'm going to keep on rowing. And I was like, exactly, exactly. Some of you just need to be reminded today to keep rowing. Jesus has not left the boat. And I want you to notice something, and this is huge, 
okay, is that the product of your trust will become someone else's benefit. See, Peter took the risk and his friends were the recipients of his catch. Because what? Called over the friends, both boats were the recipient of Peter's risk. <laughs> Verses 8 and 10 wrapping up. What's, what's Peter's response after all this happens? It says, when Simon Peter saw this astonishing miracle, he knelt at Jesus' feet and begged him, go away from me, master, for I am a sinful man. Have you ever said, go away to Jesus? <laughs> I can't do it, Jesus, it's too big for me. This is too much. And Jesus answered, and I love these words, do not yield to your fear, Simon Peter. From now on, you will catch men for salvation. Do not yield to fear, church. Don't do it. And the same message, it's, it's the message for each and every one of us today. Don't, don't you dare yield to fear. Don't yield to fear, Peter, Mary, Jane, Tom, wherever you're watching from, don't yield to fear. Don't let it take the lead, because sometimes we do that, don't we? We let fear take the lead. We're like, go ahead, you take the lead. And Peter and Jesus saying, don't, don't yield to it, Peter. So the message today, I want you to remember this, that God loves you enough to meet you on the shore. And then he asks, he's not gonna be pushy, but he asks for permission to use what you already have. Because he wants to use your positions and your passions. Then he says, do you trust me enough to head out to deep water? The place where things don't make a whole lot of sense, but it's where the miraculous catch is. There have been times in my life where it's like, God, I don't want to. I don't want to, but instead I pick up my oars, I get in the boat and I keep rowing. You guys know that even today, it's interesting. I just find it interesting. Is that guess what, we're here because people got in the boat and kept rowing. We're sitting in these seats. You're watching online because people got in the boat and kept rowing. Man, listen, if you don't do it for yourself, then guess what? Don't keep rowing or keep rowing. Don't stop rowing because other people are on the side of your yes and other people are on the side of your obedience. Here's the deal. Today, church is about trust. What area has God been nudging your heart in? Maybe it's to begin following him. Maybe you haven't made that step yet. Maybe it's to get baptized next week. Maybe it's to forgive that person or it's to take that risk or move that job. I don't know what it is. But what's the Holy Spirit been kind of nudging you in? He's speaking to you in, and you're kind of sitting in the shallows going, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I want to row out to the deep. Well, guess what? The character of God is incredible. He loves you. He's in the boat with you, and he knows what you got inside of you because he's in the boat. And so let's continue to have the attitude of if you insist. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for your word, God. I thank you for the word that reveals your character, who you are, God, that you are good, that you, you meet us we're right where we're at. God, you aren't pushy, God, but you know what's on the other side of our obedience. And you challenge us, you know, Lord, that there is, you know what's inside of us. And God, I pray for those who maybe feel weak and weary today. God, I pray that you would energize them with your strength, that they, you would renew their, if you insist, inside of them. God, I pray that we would be reminded that you are in the boat with us today. God, we love you. Give us courage as we step into deeper waters, as we row out to deeper waters. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in here today and you've never made the decision to make Jesus the leader and forgiver of your life, you've never made that decision to, to follow him Man, today can be your day. I told you today about a God that loves you and meets you right where you're at. And today, Jesus wants to meet you right where you are at. And if that's you today and you say, Jen, I want to make Jesus the leader and forgiver of my life. I want to follow him. I'm tired of rowing my own boat. I want to put Jesus at the helm. If that is you today, just slip up your hand right where you're at. Online, any of our locations, I see hands. 
So we're gonna do this in these next few moments just to seal this moment. If that is you, I want you to pray this prayer after me, but we're all as a church gonna join in because we want you to know that there is a crew of people in your boat that are with you. Let's pray this prayer together. Dear Jesus, today I choose to make Jesus the leader and forgiver of my life. I'm done rowing my own boat. I want you to be at the helm. I receive your forgiveness and your grace and your purpose today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Can we give those who prayed that prayer a huge hand clap? Wow, what an incredible message from Pastor Jen today. And if you just made that decision to make Jesus the leader and forgiver of your life, we just want to be the first to say congratulations. Yeah. That is one of the best decisions you can ever make. And we just want to come alongside of you and give you a free resource. It's called a New Beginning Resource. You can scan the QR code on screen or download it through the City First app. Yeah, we would also like to encourage you guys to take part in the growth track experience that we have for you. Yeah. Um, one of the cool aspects of this is that you can do it online and in person. And it's a really, really awesome way for you to discover your God-given talents. Um, if you do it online, you also can do it at like, yeah. your own pace, which I think is like really awesome. Go ahead, like she said, head over to the app. The app will be the place for you to get both of those resources, yep. okay? Yep, and also through the app, you can pray for others and request prayer. And one of the nice things I love about the app is you can hit it back daily. We've got daily reflections that go along with the, today's message throughout the week. You can go, um, I always suggest, hey, first thing in the morning, before you open up yeah. social media, before you get going in your day, mm -hmm. take a moment. You can open the app, read that daily devotional, and you can continue in your Bible reading too after that. But it just kind of gets you jump started as you go into your day. Like we mentioned before, next week we're kicking it off with a really awesome yes. movie, Nacho Libre. Nacho it's gonna be Libre! Absolutely amazing. Nacho. And it will be Baptism Sunday, yes. which will be fun. So, yeah, with that being said, I hope that you guys had a really incredible week. We enjoyed spending this with you guys, and we can't wait to see you next time. Yep. Bye, guys. Have a great week.